much. There was a person I wanted to introduce a little earlier uh, this evening, and I think I saw him come in, Dr. Chris Kalaki. Where are you? Off over here, Dr. Kalaki is our newly appointed uh, professor of uh, theology and overseas technology at the Divinity School, and is uh, going to be uh, April 1st, the interim uh, uh, academic dean at the Divinity College. Dr. Bob is stepping down from that role, and uh, uh, Dr. Kalaki will be there. So if you'd like to meet him after the uh, session this evening, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, tonight, it's uh, my privilege to introduce again Dr. John Oxier, and his focus is going to be the Bible and addictions, alcohol as a case study. Dr. Oxier. Wonderful to be here again with you. You know, uh, some of you may not be aware of uh, some of Lee's backgrounds coming from California. Uh, one of the good things about moving to another country is you can kind of leave the past behind. And um, <laughs> you may not be aware that Lee is an avid hunter. And uh, in fact, at one point he got into deep trouble down in California because he, he was out um, in the, uh, uh, the desert area there uh, east of L.A., and he, he uh, apparently shot a California condor, which is an endangered species, and then um, uh, decided since it had died, he'd cook it and eat it. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, rangers who were on duty in the national park there uh, caught Lee, and they took him in to, uh, to uh, be uh, you know, justly treated for his uh, damage to the environment. And, and Lee said to, to the judge, Your Honor, I have never done anything like this before. I, I had this new rifle. I, I love hunting birds. I didn't realize this, this, this thing was so far up there. I thought it was closer. I didn't realize it had a six-foot wingspan. Um, I, I'm so sorry. And the judge uh, had mercy on Lee and said, Well, I, I'll tell you what, Dr. McDonald, uh, seeing as how you are a theologian and a pastor, uh, I'm going to give you a break, but I'll tell you this. If you ever come before my bench again for an environmental charge, I'm going to throw the book at you. Lee was suitably grateful for that, and as he began to leave the courtroom, the judge said, and by the way, what does California condor taste like? And Lee stopped there at the door, and he said, well, Your Honor, it's kind of a cross between bald eagle and whooping crane. <laughs> Now, uh, it's wonderful to see this turnout. It's, it looks larger than it was yesterday. Now, that either means that you spread the word about how terrific last night's session was, or else it's a sign of a, a mob gathering uh, for lynching. Uh, but uh, it's great to see all the uh, smiling faces out there, new faces here. Now, we, we did a lot last night, but there were still a few things that remained in the handout that we, we gave out. And uh, I don't know uh, how many people have theirs with them, Okay, there's a fair amount of you. I, I, I apologize to some of you if you don't have last night's handout. I'm going to be referring to it just to make sure that we kind of cover some bases there. We're going to be going till about 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, I'll give you a chance to run away, all right? And we might take a couple more minutes uh, if, if uh, we can after that. But at 9 o'clock, I'm going to give you a break and let you run off. Um, I just want to touch base quickly on page uh, three of, the hand, of last night's handout before we move into tonight's material. We have a ton of stuff to cover tonight, as you can see from your outline as well. Um, page three in, in last night's outlines uh, was um, underlying, <coughs> we talked about the mystery of addiction, but we didn't talk about underlying factors that can feed addiction. So let's just briefly touch base on this. Uh, first one is abuse and trauma. Um, what happens to a person who is traumatized is that uh, they take the trauma and it has hurt them so bad that it creates a lot of negative feelings about themselves. Um, they may feel guilt and shame. They may feel worthless. They, there are all sorts of terrible feelings. They may feel afraid. And so in order to deal with those feelings, later on, they may learn that drugs and alcohol relieve some of those feelings or masturbation to pornography relieves that feeling or maybe getting involved with a VLT relieves that feeling, takes me away from that. And so sometimes for some folks with addictions, what's going on for them is they're, they're using the substance or behavior to self-medicate for trauma. And so in the long run, it may be 
that may be an underlying issue that you have to look at that they need to get help for. On the front end, when they're first, start, uh, first stopping, usually you don't want to get into the trauma issues because they may be just too powerful and they're going to destabilize the person. And I feel like I'm echoing a little bit, so you may want to turn it down just a tad. Um, so, uh, that's one of the factors that's an underlying factor. Another one can be a mood disorder. And again, it's similar to the self-medication idea. Uh, you might have a mood disorder of some sort, and because you're depressed, you t try to take something to counteract that depression. It may ba be the opposite thing that makes you feel even worse. So, I'm depressed, so I think I'll have a drink. Well, of course, uh, drinking uh, is going to depress you further. It deepens your depression rather than helps you. But there's, there's a part of it that somehow eases some of the pain but actually deepens the malady. Um, so an underlying mood disorder is often the case. Uh, we know, for example, with compulsive gamblers, they are not only compulsive gamblers, but they are also often depressed and suicidal. About 6% of suicides in Canada are due to gambling or related to gambling. Um, and about 200 people a year kill themselves from that. Uh, but th so depression and addiction go hand in hand, and sometimes you can't tell which one started the other. And so that may be an underlying issue or it may be caused by the addiction itself. And then there are personality disorders uh, that are associated with addictions. Um, and although there is not, uh, there was a search for the addictive personality in the 80s, it's pretty clear from the research, <coughs> I'm sorry to alert you to some of this, to this, but there is no such thing actually as an addictive personality per se. Uh, that came out of kind of a folklore of treatment that said that um, all alcoholics are a certain way and kind of stereotyped people with addictions. Uh, actually, all the studies on people with addictions show that they're pretty much a cross-section of different types of personalities. There is one factor that's, that might be a factor that sets you up, and that is impulsivity. And that's a factor we can kind of trait, call a trait factor that's long-lasting. But apart from that, generally speaking, there isn't one particular version of uh, the addictive personality, they're, they they look a lot like you and me. Um, now, we also do know that there are certain types of personality disorders that are drawn to addictions, and will tend to have that often as one of the symptoms in the cluster. Example of that would be borderline personality disorder. Uh, those folks, one of the symptoms that's common with them is being involved with an addiction. It's not true for all of them, but for many of them. Antisocial personality disorder as well. And then in our uh, discussion today, we talked about uh, at the church during our kind of talk back discussion, we talked about how folks with schizophrenia and other chronic mental illnesses sometimes will have addictions that probably are a form of self-medication. There's so many things going on for them in their heads, they're trying to do something to calm themselves down, but instead they get trapped, in addition to having their problem with schizophrenia, into a, a whole another world of problems called addiction. Um, and then finally, lack of experience with sobriety is a factor sometimes in people's recovery. If a person began using drugs and alcohol as a main coping device very early in life, they really might not have had much experience living sober. And if that's the case, when you're trying to help them get sober, it's a challenge for them because it's quite scary for them to try to face life on its own terms, as AA would say, um, without drugs or alcohol because they have no uh, time they can look back to where they are ever successful without using drugs and alcohol. So many times those folks are particularly at r high rate of relapse risk uh, when you're working with them to help them. So understanding some of these uh, factors can sometimes help you if you're dealing with a person who's troubled or challenged by an addiction as you're trying to reach out and help them. There's also a list of uh, recommendations here about how the church can help. And this is what the whole... Uh, conferences about, if you would. So I think it's important to just to note some of these. Um, first is talking about substance abuse and other addictions from the pulpit to reduce the stigma of addiction in the church. And uh, for example, find somebody who's a, a Christian in the community or in your church who has recovered from an addiction who'd be willing to share their story. That's a, that would be a, an awesome testimony to God's grace and also might give hope to somebody else who's secretly struggling but afraid to talk about it. Um, and if not that, at least you can preach on a theme that relates from Scripture about uh, the hope that people who are stuck in the struggle with addiction can find in Christ. Also, become a church where the grace of God is preached and practiced. If people believe that they uh, can be loved in spite of their flaws and shortcomings, then uh, that's a church where people are going to really work on the true things that are going on, the hidden things that are going on, including maladies such as addictions. Practice authenticity in your preaching and small group ministries. Uh, the some of the clients, particularly couples that I've worked with that have had the, the greatest 
um, recovery have been folks who have been part of a meaningful small group in their church in addition to getting professional counseling or going to other meetings. Because when they're, when they're able to go to a small group and say, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm addicted to cocaine and I don't know what to do about it. Uh, even if some of the other church members don't know much about addiction and have never been exposed to it, if they're caring people and they're willing to be transparent and authentic with them, they're a great support and they can encourage each other and be a great boost to a person or a couple who are struggling with such problems. So if we can uh, foster authenticity from the pulpit and in our small group ministries, I think it's very powerful for helping. Also, network with your local ministerial for pastoral care of addicted parishioners. That may mean uh, locating uh, all sorts of self-help groups, whether it be 12-step type groups or uh, more explicitly Christian groups like Alcoholics Victorious or um, Celebrate Recovery or Overcomers Anonymous or some of those groups as well. Um, invite Christian treatment programs to come and share their ministry on a Sunday. You have Teen Challenge here that's out of uh, Halifax. How many of you have ever had Teen Challenge come and, and uh, share in one of your services? Okay, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, I know that for myself, we, I, I had uh, personal friends and uh, a, a woman who was a graduate of the counseling program that I directed um, whose son was uh, a heroin addict. And uh, they were at their wit's end. And at their uh, church, they went to an alliance church, uh, the Teen Challenge team came in, the, uh, the, the men who came, the, who were in the program came and sang, gave testimonies. Um, and uh, they talked about the treatment program that, uh, that might, might be available for their son. And the next week, their son finally came to them and said, I've got to get help, Mom. I've got to get help, Dad. I've got to do something. And they said, we, we know exactly where we want to take you. And so he got into Teen Challenge within a week. And it was a life-changing experience. He became a Christian through the program, spent a year in a, kind of a discipleship model of recovery. And uh, he's had struggles, but uh, considering he's coming out of heroin addiction, he's doing marvelously. So um, I just encourage you, if there, there are probably other ministries... Uh, uh, that run by the Salvation Army, other groups that uh, may be reaching out to this population. And I just encourage you, bring them in the church, let them speak, and uh, let them become a resource for the folks who are in the pew. And then pastors should treat, seek training in the basics of addictions. We've talked about that uh, yesterday. And again, uh, Carol Ann has mentioned it. Uh, uh, our brother just came up and led us in prayer. It's a wonderful thing that uh, ADC has, ha has a tradition in this area and, and continues it uh, to uh, enable... Uh, pastors to learn and understand how to help folks with addictions. And plus, you've, uh, you've asked a renowned expert such as myself to come and deliver these lectures. Uh, lastly, I really encourage you as pastors, if it, for those of you who are in the ministry, to develop a referral notebook uh, where you keep information about various types of recovery groups along with the other kind of information that you gather. Um, one of the assignments I give when I teach pastoral counseling at ACT seminaries back in British Columbia, is uh, to, to require all my students to develop a big, thick notebook of community resources uh, of all sorts uh, that can help them when people are coming in crisis for, uh, for additional pastoral care. And so I really encourage you to make use of the pamphlets and other things, hold on to them that are given by, uh, there's OA pamphlets out there, NA pamphlets, uh, other ministries, AA, and uh, other uh, fellowships and, and, and so on. Make sure you pick up one of those and you, that you put it in a notebook or a place where you can get access to it the next time somebody knocks on your door and says, I've, I, my child is off the rails with drugs and alcohol, or I've got this kind of a problem that's a, an addiction-like problem, where can I get help? And that's a great time to have somebody to call up and say, um, for example, one, one individual I've met here is, specializes in gambling care. Well, you know, you guys ought to get, get his number because uh, you ought to pick up the phone next time you run into somebody who's struggling with gambling and say, what do I do? Uh, are there some programs near us? and so on. Those are the kind of resources I encourage you to collect um, and so, so forth. And then finally, there's kind of three areas when you think about um, the treatment for addiction problems. You think about prevention, intervention, and recovery support. And so prevention uh, is mentioned there. Um, there's a great program uh, that's put out by Focus on the Family called Drug Proofing Your Kids, DPYK. Uh, you might check out the Focus Canada uh, webpage. It's an outstanding curriculum. It can be run in schools. It's not explicitly Christian, but it has kind of Christian philosophy underneath it. But it's excellent, and it's really a good parent education program, how to build a good relationship with your child so that they are protected from um, the temptation and involvement in drugs. Interventions are listed in here, uh, such as learning about motivational enhancement, which I think we'll be looking at tomorrow. 
Uh, get basic screening skills to help seekers self-assess. That will be a part of the motivational um, enhancement uh, and interviewing material tomorrow. Learning to work with ambivalence, uh, which again we'll talk about tomorrow. And then be knowledgeable about addiction dynamics in families. We've touched on it briefly yesterday about the kinds of impact that addictions tend to have so you can understand why families are operating the way they are and what needs to be reset and what are the struggles that they need to face and work through. And then be familiar, as again, with the resources in your community for referral, for detox, and, and so on. Um, recovery support is kind of the third piece, and uh, we, uh, I just encourage you to be open to, support, to establishing support groups across a good spectrum. Uh, there's lots of good 12-step groups, and you can network with those. There's also Christian groups, as I've mentioned before. Um, Support groups for addiction to pornography are an area that many churches are showing increasing interest in and is a vital area. I was just talking to somebody else who's a pastor, and I've, I've talked to uh, seminary educators across Canada. This is true at our seminary as well. Lots of our seminarians struggle with these kinds of issues. Uh, pornography is in your face, and it's right there today. It's easy for you to start taking these uh, kind of mental vacations into that land, and the next thing you know, you're using up hours of time or beginning to get involved in more... Uh, serious types of uh, activity that uh, are really damaging to your integrity and undermine your relationship with the Lord and undermine your relationship with your spouse. So those kinds of groups, I just encourage you to pursue and investigate and think about. Along those lines, um, Carol Ann has reproduced, uh, I think, about a six-page bibliography, something like that, that I have for you for resources in terms of books and websites um, on substance abuse counseling and pornography counseling, in particular sexual addiction. Um, there's a few websites in, uh, on there about uh, gambling, but it's a little light on the gambling side. But particularly sexual addiction, pornography addiction, and substance abuse, uh, there's some good resources. And so I'm going to give that out tomorrow night, and we'll kind of go over some of that and give you some recommendations about top uh, resources to think about and so on. And there's also a page in there of books that I have found helpful from any mental health uh, professionals that are here uh, that are part of uh, our time so that you might find that interesting to see uh, some recommendations there for you as well. And so now I think we're caught up and we can probably go home now. <laughs> so we will, uh, we may yet be referring, there's actually a couple more sheets on that page that have some good information. So we might look at back at them as we go through some material here that relates to that. Um, but let's talk tonight first about the Bible and alcohol, and then we're going to talk about the five relationships um, that is a way I try to use to kind of structure my thinking uh, theologically about uh, pastoral care and about addictions. And then we'll also look at a question of our addic addicts, victims, or sinners. We're not going to have time to look at that too much. It's a great question, but I'm going to recommend a book if you have further interest in it. It's just there's so much material we're trying to cover. I can't do everything I would wish I could do. Um, and then of internal and external issues that a person's facing. So to kind of get you into the mind and the reality of a person who's addicted. And I'm hoping we'll be able to talk about some of the dynamics so you have a little bit better understanding of this uh, uh, idea of addiction as its attachment, this romance that you can't get out of, this, uh, this neural pathway that's gotten... Uh, a, a lot of power over a person and uh, those kinds of ideas that we talked about. And then the last portion of our time, we are going to talk about uh, AA and the 12 steps and do a, an appreciative critique of the 12-step uh, tradition. So let's start uh, by running through some passages on the Bible and alcohol. And um, what I have, I'm going to show on the screen are simply Bible passages and I'm going to make some comments to you as we go along the way. And so... Um, We'll just, uh, we won't camp out on all of these verses and so on, but we will try to kind of hit the high points and bring out some, some key points here about uh, what the Bible says about alcohol. Because after all, it's not as if the Bible is completely quiet about the issue of how do you manage intoxication. The first part we want to talk about, assuming that's on there, yes, uh, is the misuse of alcohol. Now, can everybody see that okay? Do you need the lights turned out on the where I am, um, okay, we're okay? All right. I'm going to start out with this verse, actually, from the New Testament. Uh, these, these verses, Romans 13, 12 through 14. 
Uh, Paul is writing here. He says, The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. And so there's lots you could say here. This is a rich passage. But we're going to just note right at the outset that it's pretty clear from both the Old and the New Testament that drunkenness is not seen as a godly way of life. In fact, it's often grouped in lists of very harmful types of behaviors in the Scripture that are to be avoided. So we, we know that, but we're, we're just checking and taking a new look at what the Bible says and reminding ourselves that the Scriptures say that drunkenness itself is actually a very bad, bad thing, something to be avoided, if at all possible. In Genesis 9, 20 through 27, we get a great example, and we're going to just run through some, some key examples of how alcohol is uh, presented both in story uh, and in commandment in the Scriptures. Um, this passage tells the story of Noah, who, following the flood, plants a vineyard, drinks wine, um, then becomes drunk, collapses in his tent, he's naked. Um, in their culture, to be exposed to your children was a great sign of humiliation and uh, would, would totally violate your credibility uh, in the patriarchal family system of the day. And so in the midst of this episode of binge drinking by Noah, it says that his um, son Ham, who's the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers. And the, uh, the point is here is that Ham is seen as someone who came along, found his father inebriated, drunk, exposed in this way, which was very, very um, uh, culturally taboo, and mocked him, essentially, by, by looking at him. Um, in contrast, his other brothers, Shem and Japheth, took the garment and laid it across their shoulders, and when they walked in backwards and covered their father's nakedness because they, they did not want to humiliate their father, and they did not want to, uh, to create problems in the family. But when Noah woke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, mocking him in his nakedness, um, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves <clears throat> will he be to his brother. And so here you have Noah, a great figure in the Old Testament, actually pronouncing a curse on his grandson. Uh, it's a tragic point, but I think it points out, and we could talk about, well, who was enabling Noah or, or whatever, and we certainly w wouldn't want to um, do that kind of thing. We don't know if Noah is regularly doing this or not. We have limited information here. We don't know if it's just a binge or a pattern or whatever. So we've got to be careful about going too far with it. And we certainly wouldn't condone enabling behavior where people get to do things and then there's no consequences, because we know that consequences are really a good thing, and it's kind of God's system of teaching us how to do things well and do what's right. But in this case, if nothing else, this episode points out that when particularly a parent or a significant figure is out of control with alcohol, it can upset the entire family system. In this case, it had devastating effects because Noah's own response is somewhat vicious, it, it seems like. And so w you just begin to see uh, just the notion of how a family life can get twisted up. A second passage I'd like to look at with you briefly is Genesis 19, 30 through 38. This is the story of Lot. If you know the story, story of Lot, Lot and his family lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, they fled the city under the guidance of some angels. Uh, they barely got out of town before destruction was rained down on those twin cities. And um, then what happened is Lot goes into the mountains and he settles in a place called Zoar. And he's in a cave there, and his daughters say in this passage, in essence, look, we have no chance to ever have children or a family now. Uh, we've lost everything. We've ruined everything. We're just stuck here uh, with our father. And then they plot and they plan. And they say, let's get him drunk. If we can get him drunk, we'll get pregnant. We'll have children. Now, biblical scholars would say there's a, maybe an agenda here to make the Moabites, I think, uh, look uh, like uh, a bad offspring who come out of incestuous relationship. But apart from that caveat, let's, what you see there is a great picture of how under the influence, and, and Lot is not uh, fully aware of what's going on, but under the influence, he does things that he would probably never do if he hadn't been drinking. 
And we know, for example, as I mentioned before, there's a, a great deal of child abuse occurs under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And that creates chains of disastrous problems later on. Now, I, there should be a proviso with this particular example is that in the case of incest, there's virtually no time when a parent is, is irresponsible and it's the children uh, seeking sexual relations as it is in this story. So this story is completely not in line with what you understand about child abuse in homes today. All right, so granting that, understanding that is important. We wouldn't want to draw a conclusion about that. But when nonetheless we see that the fact that Lot allowed himself to get under the influence lowered his inhibitions and he participated at some fashion in this incestuous relationship. As I mentioned before, trauma then gets passed down in families through this kind of uh, activity under the influence. I can think of one of my clients who came to me. She was about 25, a single mom, recently divorced, one child. In her family system, her mom and dad never married. Her dad was out of the picture. Um, she had a couple of stepfathers. Uh, they were okay. Uh, they weren't abusive, but they weren't very big in her life. Her mother began to develop some drinking problems off and on and largely was checked out. Her grandmother kind of raised her. When she was about eight years old, some neighbors down the street began to take an interest in her, and then they began to give her alcohol and sexually abuse her. And so from the time she was eight, she began drinking regularly. By the time she was 10 or 12 in elementary school, she was bringing alcohol to school and drinking heavily. By the time she was 14, she was on the streets, selling her body, taking every kind of drug possible. Um, she was a prostitute on and off. And this is a person who also became a Christian sometime in her teenage years in the middle of this chaotic disaster. By the time I saw her in her mid-20s, she had been in and out of treatment numerous times and was still mightily struggling with addiction to alcohol, to marijuana, and to heroin. And uh, she was trying to be a good mother but continually would relapse. One of the things that made it very difficult to work with her was the fact that she had been traumatized as a young person by other people who were using drugs. And the result of that was that it was very difficult to get anywhere with her addiction because she kept drinking and using to deal with those long-standing, unresolved, traumatic events. And so when we see things like the story of Lot, it just reminds us that alcohol and abuse uh, and things like incest go hand in hand, as do other drugs as well. Um, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Uh, again, wine is a mocker reminds you of the situation with Noah. And, of course, we all know what it's like uh, running into somebody who's been heavily drinking. And we've seen all the, you see all the movies, particularly old movies from the 30s and 40s, that has the kind of the happy, silly drunk. Um, that they, they're just kind of a clown and, and you just laugh at them. But actually, uh, being high, being drunk, causes a person to be mocked, loses self-respect, loses credibility with other people. I can think about a, a, a mentor of mine that I grew up with um, in Young Life, which is a ministry that played a big role in bringing me to Christ. And he said uh, that one of the reasons that he has chosen as a Christian not to drink was because of his family experiences with his uncle, and his uncle would come over and be completely soused and uh, urinate in the living room, lose control of his bladder because he was so um, heavily under the influence and so on. And so uh, my, my good friend who was my mentor said that basically he, he didn't want anything to do with alcohol, having seen the negative effects of it in his own family system, having seen a, a person lose all self-respect, self-control through that. So wine is a mocker. It mocks us when it becomes a significant addictive factor in our life. And beer is a brawler. Whoever's led astray by them is not wise. There's a strong relationship between particularly alcohol and violence, as I've said before. And so uh, that's uh, one of the advantages of marijuana is at least you, you tend not to load your shotgun and, and, uh, or get a knife out or start a fist fight if you're, if you're smoking uh, weed. Uh, you might go to sleep and uh, uh, be real mellow, but at least you won't try to kill somebody. But there's a strong affinity, particularly, with alcohol and violence. And, of course, we know in the case of stimulants, cocaine and particularly crystal methamphetamine, at high doses, crystal meth, chronically taken, 
produces psychotic paranoia that can uh, lead to some ghastly crimes. It's not necessarily typical of all meth addicts, but it certainly is one of the things that we'll read about in the paper occasionally as people become so strung out on it that they lose all track of what's reality and they also become hyper-aggressive as well. Proverbs 23, verses 20 and 21. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkenness, <coughs> for drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. I'll just make a couple of quick comments about this. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. Um, I think that the, uh, the writer of these verses is not saying that you, you have nothing absolutely to do with folks who are struggling with problems, but don't join in with them. Don't participate in their addiction with them. Um, sometimes that's what happens. If you ha have a husband or wife and one of them is addicted, uh, sometimes in scenarios I've seen, the, the spouse who is not addicted after a while says, look, I, I wonder what this is all about. I feel left out. So they start to drink or use with their other mate who's addicted. Uh, and it's a way of joining with them. It's a way of being together. It's a way of trying to form and save an attachment with them. But of course, it leads to further and further disaster. Uh, one of the things that happens with crystal methamphetamine is that sometimes husbands or boyfriends will um, use crystal methamphetamine with a girlfriend or their wife because it's uh, supposed to enhance their sexual relationship. And then the next thing that goes on is that perhaps the, the husband or the boyfriend doesn't get hooked, but the woman gets hooked. And then she begins to be obsessed with meth, and it begins to take over her life uh, in a way that he didn't even intend. But it, the scriptures are warning us about that. We also know in studies of college students, you can predict which college students are going to be at risk to become lifetime problem drinkers or who are engaged in problem drinking currently by taking a poll about how many of their friends drink heavily. Uh, there's a, a real solid correlation between people who have problem drinking going on in college uh, years and the social network that they're in. If they don't have many friends that don't drink, it's unlikely they're going to be a problem drinker themselves. Conversely, if almost all their friends drink heavily, they're much more at risk for developing a problem themselves. So Proverbs is correct uh, as it warns us, uh, do not join those who drink too much or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them, clothes them in rags. We also get the observation here about not just a substance problem as an addiction, but the suggestion here is overeating could be viewed and lumped together sometimes as an addiction. Now I personally, having been overweight at times, am quite sensitive to that, um, uh, connection, but uh, there certainly is, for those of us who always have struggled with can maintaining our weight uh, and so on, I lost about 50 pounds a couple of years ago, um, it, it feels very much like a compulsion. It feels very stuck, doesn't it, if you've ever tried it. Anybody here ever try to lose weight? <laughs> and, and, and so we get this connection here too, don't we? So without unnecessarily stigmatizing folks who uh, to may be a little heavier than they wish, we, we sometimes can see that it, with certain types of overeating problems. And then it also talks about how um, the both uh, drunkards and, and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. One of the things that, that happens to a person if they become severely addicted or severely dependent is they begin to have losses pile up. And those losses become greater and greater as they go along. And so you get a, kind of a, a poetical reference to that end product of being stuck in an addiction, I think, in these verses. Now, if you want to pull out uh, quickly your um, handout from yesterday, again, and you want to look at the... Um, if you look at the next to last page, it says, typical progress of an addiction. Typical progress of an addiction. This is from yesterday's handout on the top side, and it says domains of substance abuse impact and behaviors. You see that uh, there's, and again, we, we're trying to think about um, substance abuse problems as existing on a continuum, correct? Not necessarily just a straight yes, no, you have it or not, but on a bit of a continuum. So the, the early stage is experimental social use, so there's very few consequences there. Uh, at that point, in the experimental stage, people are learning the mood effects. If I 
boy, if I do this, I take this, it feels good. Um, they move into the second stage, which is seeking it. So instead of just kind of being aware of that, and it's nice when it happens, but it's not a big deal, they begin to be more conscious about saying, boy, I really need a drink. I really would, or I, I'd like to light up and, and just check out, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and they often then will begin to make some subtle changes about who they're hanging with. Their thoughts tend to be running more towards the addictive substance or behavior at that time. But they're basically still in the process of learning to uh, use and improve the, uh, <coughs> their mood by uh, using chemicals and other things. We're talking about that neural pathway getting set in place, isn't it? It's, it's starting a little bit. The, there's been road construction to build that addictive pathway uh, to the limbic part of your brain and the the conscious forebrain is getting a little bit neglected uh, during that uh, <coughs> seeking the mood swing stage. And then you have the abuse level. Uh, and uh, that would be the DSM-4 type of criteria that I shared with you where they begin to have more significant types of problems. They might neglect um, uh, an important family obligation because they were uh, using and so they were so distracted from, from that that they forgot to go to grandmother's birthday party. Or they, they you know what, they got hung over so they, they keep calling in at work. So they're beginning to have a few problems like that. Or maybe they're, dri they're, they're driving drunk. Now, oftentimes you drive drunk, you don't get caught. The, uh, uh, if, you, if you get caught dri driving drunk, usually it means you were probably driving drunk 20 times. You didn't get caught. Um, but again, it's from isolated events over the course of a year, one or two of those would qualify you for beginning to develop a problem which would be labeled uh, an abuse problem. And then level four, you have dependence set in. And that's where the losses come in that start to mount up. And, and within dependence itself, there's probably a range. Not everybody who's, uh, who's dependent is, is as severely dependent as others. But that's where, there's, that's where you kind of uh, begin to cross over into that true addiction category, where this, this is really becoming a life-dominating, serious problem. Um, and the DSM-4 criteria that are attached to uh, yesterday's handout can help you understand some of those things. Some of the things that happen to you then is you begin to develop tolerance, for example, at that stage. And that means that you, you need more of the substance or behavior to get the same effect. So whereas before, when you first snorted cocaine, it just felt fantastic and it lasted, let's say, 12 minutes. But now, when you're snorting cocaine, it seems to be lasting five minutes and you've got to keep, uh, keep snorting. It, when you first started injecting cocaine, it, it seemed to last a good 10, 15 minutes. Now it's seeming to last, you're injecting yourself every five minutes. And, so, and you're doing that all night to try to recapture the high that you had. You know, it used to be when you first started drinking, three beers was a buzz. And now it's taken you six beers or eight beers. So what's happening is your body's adapted, and so you're, you've built tolerance. The second thing that happens, too, is that when you stop using, and if you're at the dependence type of level, um, you really notice it, because your body's gotten so used to having the substance there that it's actually adapted. So to feel normal, you have to have the substance, or you have to be engaged in the behavior. If you don't have the substance in your body, your body starts to kind of scream a little bit, starts to get itchy, starts to get anxious. And if you're really dependent, you can have some fairly substantial symptoms that are, are quite painful. Um, and we all know, for example, when you withdraw from alcohol, you might have delirium tremens, for example, where you'd have terrible hallucinations. It's not necessarily a standard thing that everybody has, but sometimes that's an extreme uh, sign of uh, withdrawal symptoms. Or you'd get the shakes, uh, things like that. Um, also, then, you have increasingly abandonment of uh, important roles. So instead of just having accidentally miss something because of your using, you're starting to regularly miss something all the time. And you're losing that role of father, husband, brother, sister, student, worker, pastor, whatever your role is. Uh, it's actually being sacrificed for the addiction. And preoccupation is a real sign of this stage too, that you're spending a lot of time thinking about the drug or getting ready to use the drug or trying to find money to use the drug or preparing or hiding it or all those things put together. And so it becomes increasingly life dominating. And again, the criteria are laid out more clearly on the uh, handout uh, elsewhere. Um, when we think about uh, substance abuse as a problem, just to throw this in since we're, we're talking about some of the effects, um, 
we have down here domains of substance abuse impact and behaviors. And so when you're trying to help a person understand if they have a problem, you might want to say, well, have you ever had any legal problems because of your using? You say you don't have a problem, but you're thinking about maybe, at least you're talking to me about it, have you ever had a problem legally because of using? Well, yes, you know, I got arrested down uh, in uh, Kentville for getting into a fight at a bar. Okay, well, that's, that, that's interesting. And how's your money going? How much money are you spending a week on alcohol? And, and so on. And walking through these air life areas can sometimes give that person a sense of what's going on. Are there losses accumulating uh, for them? And that's a basic part of assessment. You might want to bring that with you tomorrow when we talk about motivational interviewing because assessment can be very helpful when you're trying to help people move away from an addiction and discover reasons to change. Proverbs 23, 29 through 35. Great passage on um, alcohol in the Old Testament. The writer of Proverbs says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. It's a great uh, analogy to the trap of um, addiction to alcohol, isn't it? And we've already mentioned, uh, as we've just really covered some of the, that, that high end of problems, that addiction end, that dependence end, uh, the things we've just chatted about are things that are truly woes. When you begin to lose your marriage or relationship because of your use of crack or, or involvement with alcohol or because you've withdrawn from really having intimacy because you've uh, become so involved in the fantasy world of pornography, uh, it creates woes. It creates sorrows in your family as your children uh, uh, see you uh, in the state of intoxication and not operating as a responsible parent. Um, it, it creates sorrow as they, they uh, have to, to mourn someone who perhaps has taken their life because they've been under the influence or, or perhaps driven drunk and uh, hurt somebody else. Um, who has complaints? Needless bruises. The chances of having an accident are much greater uh, on the workplace um, than uh, when you are under the influence. We have, in fact, a news article last month in the Vancouver Sun was talking about how the, the uh, major person in part charge of working with uh, forestry labor has come out publicly and said that drugs and alcohol and, and particularly marijuana um, are actually starting to play a significant role in producing a record number of on-the-job injuries uh, in the forestry industry in BC now. Um, who has bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? The scriptures are talking about the same things we observe medically today. Um, alcohol's uh, just about the oldest drug around. We're still seeing the same symptoms that uh, uh, our Old Testament writers uh, talk about. Um, there's additional statements here that are even uh, really fit well with the, the notion of physical withdrawal that I just mentioned before. Verse 33 out of this passage says, Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind imagine confusing things. And uh, those of you who've come out of a life of alcoholism, you could probably say, yes, that's true. That's what it was like. If you've known anybody close to you who uh, has been under the influence of alcohol and uh, been troubled by the addiction, uh, you've, you've also observed that uh, as they have gotten strange ideas or seen hallucinations or uh, other types of uh, phenomena such as delirium trim. Uh, you'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. And uh, if you see somebody go through withdrawal um, from alcohol in particular, but it's true, of course, even of other substances, we think of heroin and the the kind of painful withdrawal syndrome associated with that. It, it, it's a great uh, metaphor for uh, going through withdrawal, sleeping on the high seas, lying on the top of a rigging. Not a very comfortable place to be when you're going through withdrawal. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me up, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? People, when you're under the influence, many times you might do things that would have just knocked you for a loop otherwise, but because of the anesthetic properties of uh, using drugs or alcohol. We think PCP or angel dust as it used to be called, for example. People could do fairly uh, amazing feats of strength and fight uh, police officers and other, other kinds of uh, folks in, in the uh, medical services who are trying to assist them um, without, without responding at all to physical restraint because they were so numbed out. 
Um, again, the scripture is kind of talking about the same kinds of effects that we actually see today on the street. And when will I wake up so I can find another drink really speaks to the craving, the psychological craving that often uh, accompanies uh, addictions to substances. Proverbs 23, 29 to 35. Oops, and I went back the wrong way. Proverbs 31, 4, th <coughs> yeah, four through 4. Um, 4 through 7. Just a quick mention on this one. It says this, It's not for kings, O Lemuel, um, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. And there... Uh, he's not really prohibiting the king from drinking wine or beer because it's clear from other passages that that was a common practice and, in fact, it was not seen in any negative way per se. But he is saying, his implication is probably more about drunkenness and it's saying that the king should not allow himself to get out of control with alcohol because he has important role responsibilities. And once again, we see that as one of the areas um, of life domains that happens to people when they begin to abuse drugs or alcohol or other addictive behaviors, that their life becomes dominated by it, and it causes them to neglect significant roles, being it mother, father, being it pastor, employee, uh, being it husband, or being it wife. Uh, it says, Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. That's an actually a kind of a curious and interesting uh, kind of a, a statement about um, alcohol, and we're going to come back to that because there's, there's actually uh, one of the uses in the Bible that's recommended for alcohol is some kind of medicinal uh, type of remedy uh, for folks who may need a special uh, relief from pain. Let's, uh, let's then move into that subject, and that is the Bible and alcohol responsible uses. Psalm 104, 14 through 15 says this, and this is a great passage that, that talks about alcohol and not just drunkenness, but alcohol in general. And it refers to God, and it says, He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. So it's talking about God's provision for humankind and what God has done in His providence and how He cares about humanity and how He takes care of us. And then he says, He makes wine that gladdens the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread that sustains his heart. And what this, these verses are referring to is the fact that God has apparently um, provided wine as one of the kinds of foods and blessings that he's uh, given to humankind to enjoy. So although it's pretty clear by example and also by precept that drunkenness is seen as a disaster uh, socially, personally, and spiritually in the Bible, we also see that, at least in this passage, and we'll see it in others, that apparently alcohol properly used is not frowned upon by biblical writers. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. The prophet says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Now, Obviously, this isn't uh, meant specifically to, to be a salesman for the use of wine. Um, it, it, it's, saying, it's talking about God's grace, and it's saying he's appealing to his people who have fallen away from him to come and, and receive his grace. But it, the imagery of receiving his grace is about receiving food from the hand of God the Father. It's about receiving blessings. And so along with grain and oil, uh, wine in biblical times was seen as a legitimate part of their, their life in a, in a food, if you would, for the table that was a representative blessing of God. We see in John chapter 2, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. How many people have heard this story before? And so uh, we could follow this story, but we know the story that Jesus' mother said, uh, we have a problem, they're running out of wine, can you do something about it? He, Jesus first is reluctant, and then he, of course, uh, transforms uh, canisters of water uh, into delicious wine and is, uh, is particularly delicious and rich and is even commented upon by the master of ceremonies um, who doesn't realize that there's a miracle that's taken place. Again, not, not necessarily saying let's go out and drink wine, but certainly uh, uh, testifies to the reality of biblical testimony in the biblical world that wine was seen as a legitimate food and was seen as a legitimate part of life that could be used 
uh, properly um, or improperly. In Luke chapter 23, 36, I just throw this verse in. It reminds us from that, of that verse we saw earlier where it talked about kind of give wine to those who are uh, in pain and in, in need of it and so on. Uh, a good New Testament application of that is where Jesus is dying on the cross and the soldiers came up and mocked him. And they offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you're the king of Jews, save yourself. Well, of course, they were despicable characters, but at least the offering of wine or soured vinegar was an attempt to offer him something to relieve some of his pain. And that really matches back to what the Proverbs passage we saw earlier would say about the legitimate use, perhaps, of uh, a wine at, um, in those days. 1 Timothy 5, 22 through 23, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. And then right after that, Paul says, Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. Now, uh, I have uh, real Canadian natural spring water up here, and I, I think I'm going to stick with water tonight. <laughs> seeing as how this is a Baptist gathering, <laughs> and, and seeing as how I don't drink at all anyhow, um, but we have Paul uh, making a clear statement that, um, that there may be a, a legitimate place for an occasional glass of wine. Of course, we have some medical... Um, evidence now that uh, maybe a, a glass of wine a day, a, a modest amount. Uh, sometimes when you're working with people that uh, have problems with alcohol, they say, well, I just had, you know, two glasses of wine. Well, how, you know, they were each 30 ounces. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the <coughs> you have to ask the second question, to, to, you know, how big was the glass, which is a good follow-up. Um, uh, but again, uh, what we know is in terms of some positive health effects, uh, possibly in a cul uh, cardiopulmonary area, um, as a prophylactic. Uh, it, th so there, there are some benefits with responsible use and care. Um, Isaiah 28, 7 and 8. Um, and let's see. That's verses out of... Uh, that, that verse is out of se sequence, so we're just going to jump to Romans 14 here. Um, and here you have Paul talking where he does several times in the New Testament the problem of meat offered to idols and about what is good Christian conduct, and along with that is mentioned the issue of should people drink or not drink wine. And, of course, wine offerings were also made to pagan deities as well. And the difficulty was is that there are a lot of un, uh, new believers in the communities that Paul's writing to, and uh, some of them were very troubled because if Christians went to the marketplace, and uh, they, the marketplace was, was also uh, nearby uh, where... Uh, animals were sacrificed to various pagan deities at various chapels and, and altars. And so, and then once the sacrifice was made to uh, Aphrodite or to uh, somebody else, um, then that, uh, that animal would be brought by the priests or their servants to the marketplace to be sold because that was one of the ways that those pagan outfits made money to sustain themselves. And then Christians had serious questions coming out of paganism. Is it okay to eat a piece of meat that had originally been sacrificed in the name of some false god. Very serious question. They're trying to live in, with integrity. They don't want to support that pagan system anymore. They want to do what's right. And so Paul's trying to help the Romans just like he's trying to help the Corinthian community with this problem. And so he, he uh, re tries to resolve it more or less uh, by coming up with a principle that is, is probably tougher for us because it's not a clear yes-no binary answer. He says all food is clean. So he's really saying there's nothing wrong with the meat that was offered to idols, if you would, but it's wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. So it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. And so the principle that Paul seems to be espousing in the, this passage and the other passage in 1 Corinthians would probably be best summarized that you may have liberty to do certain things, but there are circumstances where, you may, where it is better to choose not to exercise your liberty, lest you cause uh, genuine temptation and um, problems for somebody else. Now, this is uh, uh, Joe Aldrich, who was a very conservative uh, Bible college president at Multnomah in the 80s, wrote a great book called Lifestyle Evangelism that kind of got that phrase into our language as evangelicals. He commented on this passage, and he said, the problem with this passage is sometimes 
there are folks in churches who are professional weaker brothers <laughs> who, who are constantly um, offended uh, or, causing, or, or claim to be caused to stumble by all sorts of behaviors. And so therefore they say nobody should be able to do X, Y, and Z even if it's not prohibited by Scripture. And so he says that's not what this is talking about. This is somebody who's actually truly um, potentially compromised by your behavior. And in those circumstances, you ought to be careful about what you do. And so, um, in the case of alcohol, it's not so much the issue about whether it, uh, it's clear from biblical practice and teaching, drunkenness is condemned, but not necessarily responsible use. But it's clear that there are times when it's best to abstain out of respect for somebody else who might genuinely be tempted to relapse or have a problem with it. Now, I could think of that being a case where and again, I don't drink anything, never have, okay? I'm a teetotaler. But I could think that if I were at a gathering and I had somebody who was trying to recover from an addiction, I might want to say, you know, at this gathering, we're not going to serve alcohol right now because I know my brother Joe is early in his recovery and it's hard for him to be around alcohol right now. So out of deference to him, we're not going to do that. That, I think, is in the spirit of what Paul's talking about here. And so um, it's, it's harder for us because we'd much rather have a rule that, that was said, okay, just this way. Uh, but Paul's actually making us think more about what is actually happening. So we have to make an ethical decision, not just a, a decision based on a command. So uh, lastly on this topic, I'd like to talk a little bit about intoxication as a kind of shadow spirituality. And we mentioned before that I, I would say one metaphor, one idea about addiction is that it operates as, an, a, as a deep attachment. And I talked about how it has a romantic attachment, but it, uh, we're wired for attachment and connection. We'll talk about that in a minute. We talk about the five relationships. Um, and what, that's the way alcohol ha works, I think, and that's the way other intoxicating substances or behaviors work. They end up taking over that attachment role that's really designed for God who made us for him and also designed uh, to for that intimate relationship in marriage in particular that, uh, that we're designed for in God's created order. And instead, it displaces God and displaces that mate uh, that God might have for us. And so intoxication becomes a shadow spirituality that imitates God and uh, our attachment needs are met in a false way. Um, and I'm just, uh, there's a, there's a, this is just kind of food for thought for you. So just thinking about this for a minute. Is there a relationship between intoxication in the Bible and spiritual Phenomena, And you see in 1 Samuel 1 um, that you see Hannah is going before uh, the tabernacle where Eli is. And uh, she's praying to the Lord. And it says in verse 13, Hannah was play praying in her heart and her lips were moving in her heart, but her voice was not heard. And Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. So he's trying to bring moral correction to somebody who he thinks is actually drunk and they're coming in to worship. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a connection here between that, that role that being filled with wine or being filled with cocaine and how it makes us feel and what it's trying to fill up inside with what God's plan is for us to be filled up inside with Him an independent, beautiful, loving attachment with Him. And so, if you're, if you're filled up here, you, you get the idea, just a visual picture here, Hannah looks like in the fact that she's, in a way, swept away with her relationship with God an ecstatic experience with God as she's praying her heart out, praying her guts out. It's mistaken for substance abuse in that case. And it shows you how close those are, are related, I think, in the way they work in the human heart sometimes. Um, Acts 2, same kind of thing. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples are thought to have been drunk because of the way they're behaving. They thought they were, they were high, but they were being filled by God in fulfillment of the prophet Joel's prophecy that, uh, that God's people would be filled with his spirit. 
And so we, if we begin to take a look at what the scriptures teach us about intoxication and spirituality, we begin to see how, how intoxication can be confused with it because it operates as a shadow spirituality sometimes. And even superficially, it can look like it. Ephesians 5, then, 16 and 18. Paul instructs us to be very careful, then, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here you see a direct contrast between you can either kind of, you can go get high through your addiction and base your life around it and form that attachment with it and get your, think you get your needs met with it, but it just keeps sucking the life out of you. Or you can be filled with the Spirit and let God work in your life and embrace Him and attach to Him. So you see this contrast that's there. And that's the choice that as you're dealing with parishioners who are lost, they don't know how to get attached to God because the attachment's so strong over here with their addiction. So part of it is they've got to try and figure out how to unhook from their addiction. And then part of it is they've got to be able to surrender to God and be able to, to reconnect to Him and reconnect to those significant people God's placed in, in His or her life. And I thought this was a Baptist group, and so everybody should say... So, should Christians drink is a question you could uh, come up with an answer to at the end of my presentation. Um, and I'll just make the, these uh, few points. Uh, drunkenness is clearly condemned by scriptures harmful on multiple levels. We ought to avoid intoxication. Okay, and we would certainly by, uh, easily, by analogy, apply that across uh, drug use as well. Responsible use of alcohol as a food and a mild medicine even is supported in the Bible. Um, I think we've seen that from the passages we've seen. And therefore, we have liberty in Christ. Prudent use of alcohol is okay. Drunkenness is not. Uh, fourthly, Christians may differ on this issue, and there may be good reasons to abstain based on your personal views. Recently, there was a... I'm part of a, a web server for uh, uh, pastors in my denomination, and the topic of uh, what do you do? Should people abstain or not abstain? And should churches have policies around that? Um, and I don't think we have any churches in our fellowship that have policies, but, you know, there's some people who are concerned about kind of uh, are we slipping uh, into uh, kind of uh, worldliness by not having policies that control certain behaviors and so on, or at least direct uh, certain guidelines uh, around behavior. Um, it was very interesting because you found a wide divi uh, diversity in the people who are responding. Um, there were some who were very strong on abstinence, but in every case they would say, I, we can't come up with any kind of biblical basis for it, but in every case they came out of family systems where they saw the ravages of alcoholism and uh, drug abuse firsthand, and they kind of said, I'm dead set against it for those reasons. And those are good reasons for them. Others would probably take a position, as we just outlined, saying it's really not um, uh, prohibited by Scripture, um, so therefore I, I would be willing to, to uh, consider using alcohol occasionally uh, in a careful way. And others would say, I've got the liberty to do that, but I personally think I just would rather not use it because I, I don't need any more problems in my life than I've already got. Um, and so they just made a principled decision uh, on their own free choice to say, ah, it's just something I don't need uh, more of in my life. And so I think that there's going to be some differences sometimes that we that are uh, dictated to us by our own personal history and background um, uh, around this issue, and that's okay. Not everybody necessarily has to be in the same place. And for some people, it's extremely good to be abstinent. Um, I would add this, and it's my number double four here. I always try to have at least one of those uh, in every presentation. Um, even responsible drinking may be the wrong thing in some contexts. And I think I would say this to you if, if you are a person that says, well, you know, John, I've listened to this, but, you know, I have no problem with this. I don't think the Bible says I can't drink. And I drink occasionally, and it's not a big deal. That's fine. But this last one, you ought to pay attention to. Because you know what? Do not, lose, do not use your liberty around this if it puts somebody else in jeopardy in certain situations. I was, I was, I've been dealing with a couple. of uh, Christian, He's a uh, Christian cocaine addict. And um, they came to me initially, and he had been binge, binging on cocaine. He'd been injecting cocaine. And it was a pretty big crisis. 
And I did assessment on him, and he finally got it. Maybe I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. He said, pal, I've got a serious problem. About three weeks after I started working with this couple, they come in and they're arguing about what happened on the weekend. What happened on the weekend is they got together at a party with church friends. This kind of blows my mind. Probably maybe this is your everyday experience, but for me this is strange. I'm getting old. This is a young couple, about 30. And she's all mad. She's all mad because they had deliberately planned to go to a party with some other Christian friends on a Friday night, and it was his turn to be the designated driver. And as best I can understand, this party really involved kind of like celebration of liberty and mixed drinks and experimenting with new tasty concoctions, and, and it was his turn not to drink anything because he was going to drive home for them. And of course, he went there. Uh, he's a cocaine addict. Um, and uh, promptly uh, had about six, eight drinks and fell asleep on the floor. Uh, so much for his designated driver status. So they ended up staying there until like three in the morning before he kind of sobered up enough to, to drive home. And so she was all mad because it was unfair because she hadn't been able to go there and get blasted. And, and I'm, uh, these are people from very conservative backgrounds originally. And, and I'm listening to this and I'm going, you know, Your husband's an addict. What are you doing? In my opinion, the folks that they're hanging around with in that particular fellowship, they ought to re-examine the teachings of uh, Paul in Romans and 1 Corinthians about what's smart to do, especially if you have a friend who's struggling with an addiction. They never should have gone to that party, but the folks at the party, if they're Christians, should have said, you know what, this isn't a fitting activity when we have a good friend who's struggling with substance abuse. That's abuse of liberty. And so I would say to you, if you are choosing to drink and use alcohol on a social basis, you have a responsibility to be aware of occasions when it genuinely isn't the right thing to do and, and say no to yourself in those occasions in a principled manner. You also have a responsibility to make sure that you're not abusing it so that you do not lapse into the kinds of problems that the scriptures warn us about due to the misuse of alcohol. Now, we finished that section, and I'm going to have everybody just stand up. Okay, now please sit down. Or, or you can leave if you have to, that's, that's fine. Yeah, all those who never had a drink, sit down, that's right. That's, uh, yeah. um, now, I made a promise to my, my friend Lee about my, how much time we were spending on this, but um, I... There's a lot in here to go through, but we, uh, I, here's an executive decision I'll make to try to soften this, Lee. Um, first of all, I want to say to you, if some of you have to go because you have ob obligations, I totally understand that. So if any time you want to go, I might try to go to quarter after. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. I mean, it, that'll be up to whoever wants to stay for that. Um, so having said that, there's a, n another couple of pages here, and let's, uh, j I'm just going to make a decision. Page 10 and page 11 in this handout, addicts or victims or sinners. Um, I'll just make a brief comment. Uh, Linda Mercadante, um, and her name will be on a bibliography I'll distribute tomorrow night. She wrote a very fine book. She's a Presbyterian theologian uh, called Victims uh, and Sinners. And it's a, it's a real, uh, an excellent evaluation of the doctrine of sin as it relates to the 12 steps and AA culture. So if you want to learn more about that, 
that's a very good place to look. We're not going to talk too much about it. I would just say, uh, along with our brother who opened our session, that it ascends a, a good word. It's a good biblical term. It does describe addiction. But we have to think broader than the idea of simply sin as um, violations of God's commandments. You know, we're missing the mark in that fashion because sin is, has many different levels of meaning in the New Testament. It also is kind of the sin principle that lives in me. It's not just particular acts. And it also relates to the fallenness of the world that we live in. And so does sin affect us in addiction? Do we choose to sin sometimes? Are we also victims of sin by others in this fallen world? Yes, both those things are true. But um, without going much further on that, I refer you to Linda Mercadante's book published by Abington in 1996, I believe. Um, the, there's a, a list of, of issues that arise, uh, again, coming from a Christian counseling perspective, um, relating to spirituality, internal and external uh, movement for addiction recovery. Um, I'm going to wait, and we're gonna, I'm going to cover that tomorrow night in my lecture. So I would like to move ahead and skip, back, or skip ahead to um, page 12, which is AA, an appreciative critique. Some parts of this I'm going to go lighter on, and some parts I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. Now, the history of AA and its Christian roots. As you know, in the mid-1930s, there was no real organized response to what to do with the problem of addiction to alcohol. Um, and uh, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, uh, two individuals um, who had been associated with a movement called the Moral Rearmament Movement, founded by a theologian uh, uh, <coughs> named uh, Frank Bookman, B-U-C-H-M-A-N, in Great Britain, um, he developed a, a, a system of small groups for renewal of the church that focused on the book of James in particular, but basic kind of first century Christianity is what they were all about. Uh, they talked about Jesus. They talked about the importance uh, coming out of James about uh, coming together and confessing one's sins to one another and bearing one another up and encouraging one another up building community. These were strong emphases in the original moral rearmament movement, um, or the, what was called the, the Oxford Group. There's another name for it. Well, Bill Wilson, <coughs> before he found sobriety, actually was in and out of this Oxford Group uh, movement in the East Coast in the United States. And so was Dr. Bob. And in fact, Bill Wilson, after he had his kind of transforming white light experience, where he surrendered his life to a higher power, uh, when he was on a business trip to Toledo, Ohio, what he did was he called the network of these meetings that were coming out of this, this Christian Oxford group uh, network, and he said, is there anybody that you know that happens to have a problem with drinking because I've just quit drinking and I, I think that I need to talk to another alcoholic? And uh, this was a surprising thing, and he got a lot of turndowns because people thought, well, what do you want to do, get together and drink with them? That was the natural thing. But finally, what he did was he found a woman whose husband was hopelessly addicted to alcohol. And, that, uh, and so Bill um, went to visit her as part of this network of um, the uh, moral rearmament uh, Oxford group, and she introduced him to her husband, and then they talked and talked and talked. I think it was for about 18 hours solid. And that was the beginning. That was, a, was regarded as the first initial meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so Alcoholics Anonymous really has uh, its roots in a Christian movement that was trying to restore some kind of a first century reality and authenticity in community uh, coming out of Great Britain. As the principles of AA were developed by, primarily by Bill, uh, Bill Wilson, but also Dr. Bob was involved in it too. And as, uh, as Wilson wrote the, uh, the big book, the blue book, um, and developed the 12 steps, they had to make some decisions along the way, and Wilson advocated taking out some of the more distinctively Christian aspects of the 12 steps in order to make them more broadly applicable and less objectionable on sectarian grounds. And so any mention of Jesus... Uh, or the Bible per se, they decided th that they would not include in the 12 steps. Um, however, the assumptions were broadly Christian because almost everybody involved was some kind of Christian. Uh, that was the assumption of the, of the culture that spawned uh, the 12-step movement. Um, 
they got a lot of publicity uh, fairly early on uh, because they were actually answering uh, the question, what can we do to help people who are struggling with the problem of alcoholism? Uh, and there were some dramatic turnarounds that were occurring as people began to try to work the program and, uh, and so on. A turning point happened, I think it was around 1940, because they had kind of expected to become some sort of a moneyed operation at some point, and they had this great fundraising um, situation in New York with all these famous philanthropists who had taken an interest in them. I think one of them was like a Rockefellers and, and so on. And they invited all these rich friends, and, and Wilson and, uh, and, and Dr. Bob and everybody had put on this great presentation to show the, some of the life-changing things that had happened. And at the end of it, they were shocked because the leading philanthropist who was sponsoring them and invited all these rich friends stood up and said, you know what, this is so inspiring. I think we, you know, it would be a shame to give any money to AA because it'll ruin it. It's all run by volunteers. And of course, at that time, Bill Wilson and the rest of the AAers in that early time just about died because that's what the whole point of the gathering was. But of course, as they, as they began to look back on it, it, the guy was right. This thing was grassroots. It was run by people who cared. It was run by people who had the common problem together, who were taking responsibility for the organization. And so the self-help ethos of, of AA grew out of that, that turning point, if you will. And so uh, today, it's a, a, apart from general services administration, I think in New York City, I think this is fair to say, uh, I don't think there's uh, any paid employees. Everybody is a, is a volunteer. I don't know if there are some regional uh, folks who help out with office work, but that's about it. There's no head honchos. It's all run by volunteers, and that's part of the genius of um, AA and NA and the other related groups based and growing out of the 12 steps. Uh, so that's a little bit of the history uh, of uh, AA. It also got a boost from the Catholic Church fairly early on, since particularly the Catholic Church emphasized confession and other things they particularly could grab hold of and, and appreciate. Uh, for example, the step four, step five, about taking fearless moral inventory and sharing that with another person, and so on. Uh, some of the benefits of AA, uh, it's free. doesn't cost anything. You might pass a basket to see... Uh, uh, if, who would help pay for the, uh, the rental of the, the room at the church or the, the Y or wherever it's happening. Um, it's everywhere. Uh, you can find AA meetings in small communities, big communities. It's, uh, it's difficult to find any place of any size that doesn't have some uh, AA meeting of some sort. Um, uh, there's a high degree of ownership involved in it because it's run by people who are recovering themselves. So there's a fairly, fair, fairly high degree of authenticity in the room at AA meetings and NA meetings and Overeaters Anonymous and Gamblers Anonymous and the other types of 12-step uh, meetings. Um, there's many other advantages as well. And one of the advantages for us as Christians is that the emphasis on spirituality, which is so central to AA, is I think arguably uh, compatible with evangelical Christianity with some provisos. As long as you understand that you're free to define God as you wish, but you cannot really tell other people what you believe about Jesus, and that's sometimes a restraint for us as believers. It's uh, frustrating. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's a place where you can truly talk about spirituality and what's going on for you. There are some limitations about AA's approach, and so that's part of this appreciative critique uh, that's important. One of the problems that some people have cited is that in AA circles, it's very important to label oneself an addict or an alcoholic. So if you've ever, how many people have ever attended an AA or NA meeting? Okay, fair amount of folks here tonight. It's great. If you go and sit in an AA meeting, you introduce yourself and typically say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, I'm a gambling uh, addict, uh, et cetera, et cetera, around the circle. Um, some have said, particularly cognitive psychologists, have said it's not a particularly good thing, in their view, to take as a label on yourself uh, your greatest problem. Say, to, to take the thing that has caused you the most pain and has been a kind of a negative side of your character, uh, and say, that's my identity, they would argue, isn't such a good thing. Because in general, and I would probably say this as a cognitive uh, trained therapist myself, I don't like to label myself, I try to label my behavior. And uh, labels on myself, I think, need to be ones that are affirming and, and positive, not 
a, a negative type of label. So there's some concern about that. The other thing that I've experienced personally in trying to help people is that sometimes, <clears throat> when I worked at a, a, a treatment center that was 12-step based, there was a lot of emphasis in our group work on trying to get people to say, I'm an addict. Okay, and that was kind of, got to, you know, you, you, you're not getting it unless you say that. Or I'm an alcoholic. You've got to say that or else. And my personal experience with folks is that sometimes by overemphasizing that, you actually create barriers for people because it has some stigma attached to it. And really, I don't care if you say you're an alcoholic or an addict. What I want to know is, do you think you've got a problem? That's the key point there. And so I, per and this is just, again, my personal practice. I don't care whether somebody says I'm an alcoholic or an addict. I just want to know that they're able to say, I've really got a problem. Now, when people get it, they quite often will come back to me and they say, okay, I think I'm an addict. But I don't have to put it on them or get involved in power struggles trying to make them say it. It's, if they say it, I'm, I'm with them all the way and I'm saying, if that helps you to say that, yeah, let's do that. The key there, so that's in a sense the good defense of accepting the label is if you're accepting the label because it means problem identification, yeah, great. But sometimes uh, insisting on it up front as a big deal might actually discourage them from talking to you and you might actually be able to impact them and get them to look at themselves. I can think of this uh, Christian cocaine addict I referred to who was uh, out shooting up uh, cocaine and uh, he, he had thought he didn't really have a problem. He was a recreational drug user. And of course, by standards of cocaine users, he didn't have as bad a problem as a lot of people. He was only binging maybe once every six weeks. Well, that's not so bad when you look at the people down on the street in Hastings uh, East Hastings in Vancouver, you know, where it's 24-7. And he kind of thought to his wife as she's overreacting. But when we went through some checklists and asked some questions and did an evaluation, he kind of had to evaluate himself. In the middle of the assessment time, he goes, whoa, I scored that? He says, you know what, I'm an addict. That was awesome for him. I didn't have to push him to say it. My attitude was, do you have a problem or not? And he came up with that, and that was great because he began to say, I've got to do something about my problem then. So labeling can be an issue sometimes. The other, uh, one of the other drawbacks is the idea of lifetime in recovery and the lifetime in group meetings. And as many spouses have had somebody go into recovery and they say, well, I used to have my husband used to be out drinking all the time. Now he's out at meetings all the time. And, um, and, and then furthermore, uh, he's told that his meetings are going to have to go on and on forever, that, uh, that in fact... Uh, he's going to definitely die or relapse or, or not make it if he gives up on attending. And I would just say that uh, the truth of the matter is some people make it without AA and those kinds of supports. Uh, there's a variety of ways people um, get into recovery. And so not everybody is going to stay in AA lifetime. Um, some people will do it and, and really work the 12 steps all the way for all the years. Um, he, would, he talked about 40 years in recovery, I think. Uh, when we chatted and so on. And he's been strongly involved in the fellowship all that time. Other people will go and get some help for a year or so, or two years, and then they'll gradually taper off, and it won't be so significant. But when they're having problems, they'll check back in. So it's not, so, so the question is, does it have to be a lifetime allegiance? Uh, some people would say absolutely yes, uh, but some people feel uncomfortable with that. And then uh, we mentioned this today in our, our meeting over at the church. There's sometimes there's an anti-medication mentality that, criticizes people for taking antidepressants and other things because the, the historic AA uh, slogan of a drug is a drug is a drug sometimes isn't very nuanced uh, about there may be legitimate places. If you're bipolar, you ought to take your lithium. Okay? If you don't take your lithium, chances are your, your sobriety isn't going to be making it either, and so on. Um, I'll just make a couple of quick comments here about AA's effectiveness. One of the problems about AA is that does AA work? And the answer is absolutely for those people who will do it. But the problem with Alcoholics Anonymous is that, it, is that there's a fairly high dropout rate. Let me give you the illustration. This is from AA's own triennial survey in the early 90s. If you recommended AA to 100 people on January 1st who were all alcohol dependent, on December 31st, how many are still attending AA? 
10. 90% dropout rate. Out of the 10, six will have maintained sobriety with AA, and four will be struggling in and out, probably. Now, that's actually pretty good. What it says is, if you work that program, and if that's the program that's a good fit for you, about 60% of people will get really solid help there. And even those who don't get full recovery out of it, they're probably better off. They're probably drinking less, using less, okay? Because they're, they're getting some benefit. But it reminds us that if we've got a, such a high dropout rate, is the problem, well, they're just not serious about the recovery? Or is, are some of those folks finding other paths to recovery? Are there other resources that people are using? And so I think that one of the things that's happened in the research on substance abuse treatment in the last 20 years it's become increasing attention first on doing some better research on AA so we can understand the great benefits from it, but also developing additional strategies to help people. And that's really important. Because if you conclude, uh, AA was originally formulated, if you look at the disease model that was developed uh, by Jelinek at Yale, for example, in the early 60s, we wrote, wrote the book on the subject. He came up with five types of alcoholics, one of whom was called a gamma alcoholic. He named him after letters of the Greek alphabet. That's the third letter of the Greek alphabet, Craig. Um, and gamma alcoholics were folks who drank and exhibited a loss of control. Whenever they started to drink, they could not stop until they were totally toasted. And Jelinek classified that particular group. And in his book, he said, I think this is the group that probably would benefit most from Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I think he's right. And that's why when we think about the disease model of AA, it very much fits that kind of notion that there's an inherent biological problem that leads always to loss of control, that it's a chronic progressive disease. The difficulty is, is there's some drawbacks with the disease model, and it doesn't fit the whole spectrum of alcoholisms, because actually alcoholism is not just one thing it looks like a bunch of different things for some different people. There's binge patterns. There's uh, different types of drinkers. And there's people who are only abusing alcohol who may not need to go to 12-step meetings forever because they do need help and intervention, but that may not be what they need. And there's other people who are in that addiction category who really need the structure and the work of the 12 steps very strongly. So I guess one thing I'm going to say to you tonight, and we, we really need to, to be stopping very shortly. I've got about five minutes left here before I said I'd be done. What I'm trying to encourage you there is, is, uh, is to say um, uh, zest for the 12 steps and uh, AANA and the family of fellowships that have developed out of there because they're awesome resources. But also encourage you to think more broadly about lots of options for people as much as possible. The, the folks I see really get getting, uh, getting the heck beat out of their addiction, who can really take their addiction on and beat it, are folks who do a variety of things. They may use some kind of small group um, type of uh, interaction like AA or a church-based group like Celebrate Recovery or a men's support group for pornography um, or some other type of group that helps them with their problem. But then they also may have a couples group at their church that gives them tremendous support. And for some people, if they're in that kind of community, they don't need as much some of the other types of support that a more isolated person might need in a 12-step group, for example. Um, having well-trained counselors who can do good substance abuse counseling, who are available to work on trauma issues and some of those deeper underlying factors, that might be another area that's needed to help. Having godly pastoral care with pastors who understand the dynamics of addictive thinking and how it affects a person spiritually and family-wise and socially and all the other impacts that it can have. And so what I would just advocate to you is that there isn't one the answer. It's important to work multi-level when you're trying to help a person with a life-encompassing problem like an addiction. And the more multi-level stuff you get going, the better off they are because it helps break down those old pathways. It helps break the association learning that's happened there because you're bringing new input coming from different directions. And you can really help that person become transformed in so many ways through multiple options. Um, 
there's a couple of notes here on the bottom of page 12, why AA works. It's a, uh, again, AA does so many good things. It renews a person's mind by giving them different ways to look at things. We think about the, the slogans down there. Slogans and prayers, renewing the addicted mind. Easy does it is a great bumper sticker. I should have that on my, on my tattooed on my forehead so I can calm down. Um, but it, it's the idea of one day at a time, taking it easy, not looking too far ahead, lowering your anxiety, learning how to soothe yourself, calm yourself. Um, the serenity prayer talks about acceptance of things instead of beginning angry, upset, bitter, and so on. So the, co the, the Lord's Prayer is widely practiced in many 12-step uh, groups, um, even though otherwise it, it's not particularly necessarily overtly Christian. But that is one place where there's been a real uh, uh, tradition of holding on to a Christian prayer that, again, connects people to God. So many good benefits that fit the kinds of needs that people with addictions have. There are some questions sometimes for Christians, such as, where's Jesus? And that the, the God of our understanding is not necessarily the God of Scripture. And does the disease model undermine personal responsibility? Um, I would just say that the 12 steps, I think, in general are compatible with Christianity as long as you make sure that you are uh, aware of why you're using them. And jumping down to the bottom of this page, um, recommendations regarding the use of AA. AA is a great line that I use all the time in my own life, and I tell my students this when they disagree with me. Uh, use what fits and leave the rest. Um, that's a great line. It's kind of that part of that easy does it. You don't have to agree with everything and something to find there's some benefits to it, some great benefits. And so when you think about AA as a Christian uh, leader, and you're used, many folks are involved in the fellowship yourselves, for pastors here, clarify why you send people to AA. Do you send them there for theology or recovery? I once had a, a woman who was a crystal meth addict who I sent to NA. It was pretty funny. This is a woman who has done, had done some pretty substantially bad things in her life. And uh, I won't go through the list, but it, it, pretty bad. And so here she is. I'm, I'm trying to find social support for Send her to NA. She comes back and she says <coughs> she's, she's a Christian. She says, well, I don't want to go to that AA group. You know, she, she'd sell her body. She could commit adultery. She could do all sorts of things. I don't want to go to AA group because those people swear. And, and, you know, and you're just, you're, you're going, you know, it's just like the same thing that happens after, some, <laughs> you know, somebody comes out and they're in the, the treatment facility and they're refusing to take vitamins and, they, because <clears throat> and they've been using every drug in the book now for, for 10 years. They're refusing to take vitamins because they don't want to pollute their body. You know, it's the same kind of, of craziness. And um, I guess what I'm, I'm saying there is that I, with that woman that I just referred to, I say, well, I'm not sending you there for Sunday school, you know. I'm sending you there to listen and learn and get some help with your addiction because you're way out of control and you need all the help you can get, okay? And so don't send somebody there primarily, first of all, to learn Christian doctrine because it's, <coughs> it's compatible with Christian worldview, I think, but it's not going to teach you like the church would. And you still need that from the church. So use it for what it's meant for, which is to help support your sobriety. Don't worry about what it's not going to do. That you'll get that, let's get that in place elsewhere in your recovery program. Uh, maybe through mentoring with a godly Christian friend who can, who can uh, take some Christian standpoints on some issues that you're facing. Um, then also AA is a good resource, but not the only road, as I said. And it's not a lifetime for everybody. Um, but it will be for some. And it will be helpful along the way. And then AA groups vary in personality and design. So shop around for best fit. That's very important. If you're going to send somebody, try and recommend a couple of groups and try and say, try a couple times. Because sometimes you'll be there on an off night and it doesn't fit. But I've got a client right now who's going to NA. And um, he's, uh, it's, it's really clicked with him. But he tried two or three groups and some of them weren't so good. So he's found one that's kind of clicked and he feels like it's his home group. Well, that's great. So just realize there's different personalities. Some of them accept smokers. Some of them do not. Some of them are for women only. Some of them are for men only. If you contact the uh, AA main number that's here for the Maritimes, I think it is. Um, it's, I think it's located in Halifax, actually. There's a, a phone number, and I've got this, on, I think, on my list of uh, references for you for tomorrow to distribute. Um, you can always find out where the meetings are, what kind of meeting they are, and encourage people to try a couple to see which is a good fit if you're going to use that type of uh, help. Well, the only thing I've skipped over here is some stuff about the disease model. 
and uh, I'll just give you the bottom line on it. Um, the disease model, strictly speaking, doesn't hold up. Okay, I've already mentioned it's not quite a unitary disease when you think about alcoholism. There's actually probably multiple kinds of alcoholisms that work together, that look different. It's not always chronic. Some people stay stuck at a certain level of dysfunction, but they're fairly functional. They don't always, um, <clears throat> and sometimes they, they're able to quit without any help. I had a, a guy that was uh, later addicted to some other stuff, but he managed to stop alcohol, even though he's very dependent, totally on his own. He had no help. He didn't even use me. You know, that was tragic. I felt sad about that. <laughs> um, but people ha are quite resourceful, and they have a natural ability sometimes to recover, depending on what kind of resources they have. So there's, there's uh, multiple ways to recover, and, and addiction is not always chronic, although it typically is. Now, having said that, let me make a caution here. Generally speaking, even behavioral science, even though there's uh, some people seem to be able to, to back away from what would be called dependence and move towards more social drinking, that is a tiny slice of the human population, okay? Very, very, very few people can return to any kind of recreational use of a substance once they are qualified as substance dependent. That's why even in the DSM-IV it says, if you've ever been diagnosed as substance dependent, you cannot be diagnosed in a lower degree. That is gonna be your diagnosis. Okay, in the future. You can't be seen as just abusing. And that's because of those neural pathways and those other things. So uh, having said that, there are some people who are probably in that abuse level that go back to some sort of lesser problem. But once you get into the far end, it's tough to do anything that relates to chemicals without getting re-addicted or cross-addicted. And if you know anybody that struggles with an addiction, they're often easily attracted to anything that's addictive once they've got that pleasure pathway lined out. Um, and then uh, the issue of loss of control, it's not exactly an instantaneous response biochemically. It also has to do with what your expectations are uh, when you're drinking. We know sometimes people actually who have very high dependence in some social settings, if there's high expectations they won't drink, they can control themselves and not overdo it. However, that's a very limited time kind of thing and more of an experiment rather than an everyday life experience. Bottom line is, is uh, are addictions to substances diseases in a literal medical sense? I think most people who are experts in addictions today would say probably doesn't fully qualify. But having said that, I'd say that generally in the field the consensus is that addiction as a disease is a useful metaphor because it's pretty clear that addiction operates kind of like a disease and it helps capture that life-dominating and deep-rootedness aspect of addiction, which gives it so much power and mystery over people. Now, I have numerous people making secret hand gestures. Lee's almost out of his chair. He's going to fall over if he doesn't get up here. So thank you for your indulgence tonight and uh, putting up with uh, the lateness of the hour. Hope to see you back, and we'll talk about motivational interviewing, and we'll go over these spiritual uh, movements uh, that were in the handout tonight, uh, tomorrow evening. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that.